the air commanders of Desert Storm talk about how they fought the war, focusing on the U.S. Air Force's role. Allied bombing was relentless. In the last 11 days of the air campaign before the ground campaign started, with precision weapons of the 111s and F-15Es, we destroyed in excess of 1,000 tanks. We destroyed in excess of 300 artillery pieces. At day 30, General Horner gave this assessment of the air war. We've had some tough times in the 30 days, uh, uh, particularly unusual weather in January. It was far worse than we'd forecast. And uh, it was only because we were doing so well in our counter air campaign, taking down airfields and uh, SAM systems, that we were able to uh, maintain the schedule despite uh, the loss of a lot of sorties up to 50% uh, some days with regard to weather. Uh, but I think more importantly, we've demonstrated that we've been able to dig out his forces in the field in Kuwait. Uh, we've had uh, particularly good luck with uh, our systems at night, the F-111s, the F-15Es, and the F-117s. In fact, uh, I think their bombing accuracy is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, I think the uh, yeoman's work is being done by the uh, B-52s, the F-16s, and the A-10s in uh, bringing large amounts of munitions to bear against him, and I think that's beginning to pay off. It has to be very difficult to be an Iraqi soldier and uh, sit there night after night, day after day, and endure the pounding that he's taken. As is vividly described by one of the POWs, said the airplane that they feared most on the front lines were the A-10s, because their accuracy of using the POW's words, they never missed, and when they overhead orbiting, and you were in a, a tank or in, with a group in a revetment, you didn't know if you were being picked out. So it was a very unnerving situation to experience and had a tremendous psychological impact. Despite Saddam's fortifications all around Kuwait, his flank in Iraq was weak and exposed. General Schwarzkopf wanted to exploit it. He had airlifters position thousands of troops and equipment for a massive Allied thrust through Iraq. One of our biggest jobs that we had over here was to move major elements of the 18th Airborne Corps starting on uh, the day after the bombing started. For the first 14 days, we had a 1.30 schedule into Rafa every 10 minutes, 24 hours a day. That ability to move that vast amount of people and a lot of their vehicles that quickly, uh, in my mind, Saddam Hussein never caught on until much later on in the ground war that there was anybody even up there. B-52s and the F-117s teamed up to hit Iraqi breach lines as the ground troops made their final preparations. We put massive B-52 strikes in to bomb through those areas so that there would be clear paths that went through the breach areas so that when the troops went through there would be a pathway cleared of mines and the wire would be cut. The F-117s with their precision guided bombs, entered the battlefield, took out the feed points of the entire oil trench system that he had developed, that he was counting on to fill trenches and set them afire to make the breaching more difficult. It was time for the ground troops to liberate Kuwait. General Schwarzkopf launched the ground war on February 24, 1991, 39 days from the start of the air campaign. The original Allied plan was only nine days off schedule. Negative radar contact. Roger that. We're garlic one three. Allied air power entered phase four, providing close air support. It's very difficult in a very fast-paced ground campaign such as this war featured for the Army to know when and where they're going to need close air support. So we created a system called push cast. And what we did is we pushed sorties forward over the battlefield every minute of the hour, and we were able then to divert those sorties to where the Army needed them for emergency situations during close air support, or if there was no need from the Army, we would then send them on to do an interdiction target uh, beyond the fire support coordination line. There's a CDU hit. I had briefed all of those uh, division commanders and, and cavalry commanders before uh, the war started, and I said, we will destroy a minimum of 50% of the armor and artillery before you cross the uh, boundary or before you start the ground war. Based on what they found, 
I think there's no doubt in their mind or anyone else's that we exceeded 50% very significantly. One of them relayed to me, he said, I got to admit, sir, the majority of the tanks I shot, I shot in a radiator, uh, which means a tank's running. The Iraqis were routed. They surrendered by the tens of thousands. One of the captured division commanders, when asked, how come you didn't use your artillery? And he replied, my artillery was destroyed by air 100% before the ground campaign started. And in fact, I called for artillery support from the division next to mine, and their artillery was destroyed 100% by air in transit to support my division. I will tell you my private conviction is that this is the first time in history that a field armory has been defeated by air power. truly was the wind that carried Operation Desert Storm. But if there's one thing that this war really validated, it is the excellence of our training and the quality of our people. And I say that not as any kind of an advertisement or any kind of a bombastic statement. It's absolutely true. The uh, people that put this whole thing together are absolutely brilliant, from aircraft mechanics to communications to uh, combat photographers, to uh, cooks, to uh, pilots flying the missions and intelligence officers doing the briefings. There's so many of those young people that work day and night on those uh, ramps and would sleep two or three hours in a hangar and get back up and start again. And now that's dedication uh, beyond belief. And they deserve uh, all the credit in the world. And my hat's off to them.